We would all love as dementia caregivers to have that extra set of hands, that extra support, the extra compassion in the home of our loved one's choice. How do we get that? Where does it come from? And when can we get that? I've brought someone today, a dear friend of mine from years and years ago, Christina Caulfield, who has been a nurse for 22 years, um, who started in the skilled nursing world, but left there and went to hospice as a hospice nurse and then was trained massively trained to be a hospice educator. And uh, when I met Christina in 2017, she began to educate me. And we'll share a little bit more about that. So make sure you stick around. But welcome, Christina. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited to be here today. We are excited to have you. Now, Christina is more than just a nurse. I wanted to also mention she is a fantastic wife and mom of three children and a fur baby, of course. And in her spare time, she does things like, you know, martial arts. And um, she, she could get a little violent, but most of the time she's just down to earth and compassionate. So, Christina, today, though, I wanted to bring you in as one of my favorite educators. Um, In 2017, I met you, and I had a very different taste in my mouth when people mentioned the word hospice. I lost my grandmother 21 years ago, and back when I lost her, hospice was brought in you know, three days before someone passed. Um, My grandmother in the last several months of her life, uh, she had been in and out of the hospital. She ended up in the hospital, had pneumonia, had tubes coming in and out, um, was being suctioned. Uh, Her husband, who also had uh, advanced dementia, was very confused by the whole thing, wanted to be with his wife. And it it was a difficult time. And then they looked at us and they said, she can go home on hospice services. And so a few days before she passed, we were able to bring her home and it was a whole different scenario. I met you and you began to educate me on what hospice today looks like, what that benefit looks like today. And I was shocked to find out that it is not just something for the last three days of life. So you had a fantastic story of what hospice looks like for someone living with dementia, and I asked you to come and share that with us today. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I want to start right there with your story because I hope that our viewers can see you still get emotional 20 years down the line because the first thing about hospice care is never removing the fact that it's always someone's tragedy. Yeah. And I think that's the pivotal part. And and one of our first actually educational sessions as Julie being a supportive friend and we had met and worked together with the Alzheimer's Association and moving forward with, you know, Julie, can I talk to you about this? I'm so excited in you indulging <laughs> me was I introduced you to Someone that VITAS, you know, and it's VITAS Healthcare, but we're a hospice provider, had the honor of taking care of. Yeah. And the case study, her name is R.A. And I even named her and I have her in my mind and I see her because it was R.A. is everywhere. Yeah. And I call her Ruth Ann. And you still reference Ruth Ann when you're like, oh, Christina, I have found another Ruth Ann. They need your help. Yes. So let's meet Ruth Ann today. I, I, I can't wait for you to tell this story. Okay. So Ruth Ann, RA, is someone that VITAS had the honor of caring for that was an 87-year-old young lady with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, which is really a hot topic right now. Okay. But Alzheimer's and dementia, I think people don't realize, and we'll stick a pin on her with Alzheimer's, it's a terminal illness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And RA had had this disease for four years. And her daughter had those 36-hour days, as we call it in a really good book, of caregiving for her. And she remained steady for a while. She needed a little more help. She had some things happening that we call functional decline. Yep, yep. And you and I put her out and looked at her. So R.A. was, you know, without her words. So she couldn't express her needs. Okay. Sounding familiar. Yes, very. 
even down to the word salad, where I'm sure she's the young lady, like I had someone who would want to watch television, and she would say, uh, honey, turn on the orchestra. Yes. So R.A. had the confusion. She had the long days. Her daughter was very involved in her care, but then we had something that was a life-defining event. With the brain disease, she then got very ill with a, an infection, let's say a UTI. Okay. And she got incredibly confused and had the delirium. Mm -hmm. So she goes to the hospital. And she gets IV antibiotics and she gets different interventions. And then she goes to a skilled nursing facility. And then we're going three more months. And uh uh-oh, RA's lost seven pounds. She's not swallowing well. She's not Mm -hmm. on a lot of medication. Maybe she's on some Aricept and some aspirin. But now she really can't get out of bed. So she went from that home care with her daughter to having a facility care. Yeah. Then she leads a bed-to-chair existence. Yeah, so even just sitting in the recliner, right? Correct. So they could sit in the recliner for nine-tenths of the day. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And that still. Mm-hmm. So that's your person. Ruth Ann is our friend who is maybe getting up out of bed about 10 a.m., and she's getting help to her recliner, and you're bringing her her breakfast, but she's not swallowing well, and she's losing weight, and she's not speaking and voicing her needs well. And now we're having to go past cues to help her get dressed or, well, oh, we're dressing, Mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we have that life-defining event. Is it an infection? Is it a fall? Is it bed-to-chair existence, as we call it in nursing, But yes, we're sitting or we're in bed. You know, mom's confused. Mom's tired. At that point, she is eligible and could be eligible for the extra set of services that hospice provides. Yes. Even if she appears to be pretty healthy, she's just kind of living her everyday life. Yep. Now, these activities of daily living Mm-hmm. You talked about the dressing. Now she needs help with dressing. Mm-hmm. Maybe she, sometimes she even needs help um, prompting her to eat. Mm-hmm. Uh, now she's probably needing help with bathing. Mm-hmm. She may be incontinent. She might still be making it to the toilet on time, but might not. Mm-hmm. Those are all the cues that we are starting to see. Mm-hmm. And tell me what we what can we do at this point? Oh, here's what we can do. We can do a goals of care appointment. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to call it goals of care. I like to call it, I don't like to use the word referral to hospice care because that takes away the family component. Right. Yeah. We can call VITAS and say, you know, I'm seeing changes with mom. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing changes with dad. I'm seeing changes with my loved one where now they're not making it to the restroom and they need help with those activities of daily living, they are declining piece by piece. Mm -hmm. The days are long. It's more than mom is just tired with Alzheimer's and she's lost weight or she's fallen down or she's had pneumonia or a hospitalization. Yeah. And we can come in and sit down and talk about, and as as much time as it needs, what do you want for your loved one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you and I talked about it shifting at that very moment. It even starts with that phone call from an Alzheimer's-driven daily life plan of care. Because we know we're going to have a PCP involved a, or a general doctor, your family doctor right. for 20 yeah. years. And it became a Ruth Ann-centered plan of care. Yeah. What were her wishes and values before she lost mm-hmm. her mentality? What did she talk about? Does she want to be home? You talked about home. Or in the home of her choice could be an assisted living community. Very much so. So, or it even could be skilled nursing. Some people have been in skilled nursing and now they're in this position. Yes, very much so. The The biggest component here is a Ruth Ann centered plan of care that we talked about mm-hmm. in her home of choice. Right, yes. And that's something that VITAS does that's genuinely so special to me and special to my heart, um, having all these experiences with nursing and hospice nursing and even working with a different company before coming to VITAS as an educator, Mm -hmm. is that we bring the help to you wherever you are. Right. And here in our area, we have some 
we have some boondocks. I mean, you've got some counties that are out there and you still bring hands to those folks. We do. We do. We can bring a care center to your home. Pretty much, yeah. And and bring for a, a rapid decline or a big transition or even educating the caregiver because it's frightening to take care of someone that is either actively passing away or rapidly changing or has breathing changes or pain, we're here to help. And that's one of the components, like I said, about keeping them at home that we've talked about prior, is at 3 a.m., you're going to call and get, hello, thank you for calling VITAS. I'm Christina. I'm a nurse. How can I help? And if a nurse needs to be dispatched, let's do that in place of another ER visit for Ruth Ann. Especially since we've seen COVID. It is scary to send our loved ones to sit in the ER for hours and hours at a time. Especially if they're confused. If they're confused, and then you've got family members being exposed to whatever is in the ER as well. So now you may have a caregiver that catches something there. I mean, just tons of reasons not to be in the ER if we can at all avoid it. Right, right. So, you know, when we think about hospice care, and I wanted to go back to how you opened because it just resonated so so deeply. I was sitting like, yes, Julie. <laughs> Hospice is not a place you go to pass away for the last 72 hours of your life. Hospice is a full package of services yep. that is no cost to the patient. You know, it comes through that Medicare benefit or we work with it and it's, it's medical equipment. It's a hospital bed for Ruth Ann in her home. Yeah. It's a doctor if she needs a doctor's visit at home or a nurse practitioner, a registered nurse and an LPN, a social worker. Oh, that's golden. A chaplain and volunteers. And you talked about home, a home for the holidays. We are pushing into October. Mm-hmm. Let's think about November, December, January, cold and flu season. Yeah. Home for the holidays, not in an emergency room. How does that impact you? I mean, I want to hear you have so much to offer. Tell me. It does. It truly does. Um, I I wanted to share a story, too. I had a precious friend uh, who actually spent years teaching me music. And um, his son called me one day and they had been family friends of my parents and then family friends of mine all my life. And uh, his son called and he was so concerned and he said, you know, Dad just doesn't seem to want to do anything anymore. He doesn't want to go anywhere. Uh, It's really hard for me to just get him dressed and have him sit on the porch. He doesn't want to drink. We're constantly trying to force liquids down him and force Mm -hmm. him to eat food. And I feel terrible about that. And uh, because of the education that you had given me, I was hearing all kinds of those, um, those signs that maybe it was time to bring extra hands into the home. And so um, he was able to have one of those uh, care meetings, a care plan meeting with VTOS, and they did decide to bring him on services, and he was on services for a couple of months, and it avoided him having to go in and out of the VA numerous times. Um, His wife also had advanced dementia, And any time you've got a couple that is traveling down that path together and one of them is going to the hospital for days at a time, the other is just in a tailspin. It's so difficult for both of them, not to mention the caregivers that are trying to run back and forth between the two. So that was the situation that we were avoiding. And one Sunday, I was actually playing piano And I got a message from the VTOS nurse, and she said, hey, um, somehow I was in the phone loop, I think, because I had turned that referral over to you guys. And she said, hey, um, I I heard about the fall, and I'm gathering my things, and I'll be over shortly. I called her back, and I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Fill me in. So she said, well, we got the call this morning that he's fallen, and I'm headed over there. We're going to do some continuous care for him until we manage his pain. So he did not have to get thrown into, and they never throw people into uh, an ambulance, but he did not have to go for an ambulance ride, uh, separate from his loved one, go to the hospital and sit there for hours. 
the nurse was there. She administered pain medication. The family was able to have some time with him. His bride was right there beside him. And he was able to just pass peacefully in the home of his choice. I still have goosebumps. And it just was so much more peaceful than that in the hospital and back home and running to the doctor's office. And it just was so much more peaceful. So I really, really wanted to bring you here to to really hammer down what does it look like when my loved one has dementia, Mm -hmm. can we break it down into a nutshell? Is there a way to look at it and say, they need a dementia diagnosis. How many of those activities of daily living do they need to have help with before we can start having that conversation? That's my favorite question. Before I move to answering that, I just want to thank you again for trusting us with the care of your loved one. Because that's where we lay in bed at night and say, yes, this is why we do what we do. Yeah, it it is. It really and truly is. So just wanted to stop on that for a moment because that impacted me just seeing you talk about it. So we talked about RA, but I'm going to put it about with anyone. And and we have a tendency to go to head to toe with nursing or education. Let's think about that then. So dementia, dementia set apart de from that word so when we are apart in our thinking and our words are not making sense and we are down to not voicing i'm hungry i'm thirsty i need to use the restroom you know at five o'clock every day i need to grade the school papers Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i need to catch the bus i want to watch the orchestra yeah not able to really verbalize or have what we call an intelligible conversation. I don't really like that word. I like the idea of an understandable, you know. Yes. You yes. taught me many years ago about listening to understand. So as a caregiver, if now you're not understanding what your loved one needs. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that's that head. Okay, let's talk about speech, swallowing. Mm-hmm. Are we having a difficult time? Are we eating less? Have we lost, you know, 10% Mm -hmm. of our body weight? Yes. A lot of us want to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, but it doesn't normally work that way. Yeah, (laughs) seriously. What about a 10% body weight over about six months? Okay. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because we're we're going down. Okay. What about moving down to hands? Are we now not dressing ourselves little things like brushing teeth and buttons? Yeah. Are you dressing your loved one now where it shifted from mom, let's put on your shirt and you could help to now we're buttoning it for yeah. mom. Yeah. Okay. And showering at that point. Too, and bathing. Right? Correct. Yeah. Those those facial cares, those activities mm-hmm. of daily living moving down further. Are we occasionally incontinent? Mm-hmm. Have we lost control of our ability to use the restroom in, independently yeah. or not making it? Yeah. Yeah. Then we go down to our legs and our feet. Are we always in the recliner? Are we sitting? Is this, well, it's time to get mom up for breakfast. Maybe she's eating in the bed, in a flat bed, in a home. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and we're walking her to the chair. And you're setting up her little capsule, her little pod. Here's your TV tray. Here's everything you need. Here's your water. And we're checking in on her because she is Isn't not moving. going anywhere. Mm-mm. She wants to sit outside. Are you having to take her outside? And I'm using the female just because of that's the case study of RA. Ruth Ann. So any person that has assistance requirements with two or three of those Mm -hmm. activities of daily living. Yep. So dressing and feeding yourself and, you know, going to the restroom and speaking and walking all of those things, and if you have anything else wrong with you, like RA, all she had was a little bit of thin bones. She had some osteopenia is what we call that. So she mm-hmm. was fragile, so she was falling. Yeah. So it's a risk. Right, right. Do we have, you know, high blood pressure or have we had diabetes or, or was there a heart attack in, sick, you know, in your age of 60 and you now you're in your 80s? We can always assess and I wanted to kind of compound on that when you said, when is it time? That's when it's time. And something a lot of people don't know 
is that not only do you, you get that package of services with VTOS Healthcare, and this is VTOS, if there's one VTOS, there's all of us, but we can look at evaluating for physical therapy or occupational therapy because you talked about your loved one's fall. Yeah. Yes. And the caregiver issue. Yeah. We will always evaluate right here on admission, do they need help with that medical equipment that they get at no cost to them on how to use it for fall and safety training? Yes. And typically what you see is that if you are on hospice services, you are no longer doing curative things like physical therapy and mm-hmm. occupational therapy. Mm-hmm. We're saying we are looking more towards the end of life. However, what you're saying is that there could be some opportunities for that physical therapy and that occupational therapy, at least to even teach them how to use some of that medical equipment that you're going to bring in and provide. Correct. Also, incontinence equipment that you guys bring in and provide. I, which I think is a whole nother wonderful advantage. Um, so we can also access some of those therapy options as well. Correct. Correct. That's my favorite thing that, you know, all hospices are reimbursed by Medicare nationally. We have standards set up. But how we deliver that package of services yeah. has substantial differentiators. So if you're looking yeah. at choosing a hospice, that wants to do a whole person care, ask those questions. Yes, yeah. Are you going to give me this equipment? And we talked about RA's daughter, right? The caregiver who was very involved. Well, now you have a hospital bed and an overbed table and a bedside commode and a wheelchair or maybe a, yeah. a walker. Let's have someone come in and teach her because if you have an 87-year-old mother, you're not 25. Yeah. How do we help her right. daughter transfer safely without injuring herself. That's that's just such a service and such a whole person, family-centered, um, proactive is what I call it. I am loving that you brought that up because that is not something I think a lot of families know is available if you are in hospice services. Yes. And it may not be available through every hospice company. So that may be something that you would want to ask if you are looking at hospice services. Mm -hmm. And not everybody has a VTOS in their town, although VTOS, I think, is in 15 different states and Washington, D.C. But you may have Hospice of Marion County or one of those other hospices in the area. These are questions that you can ask them to make sure you're getting the care that you need for your loved one in the home. Ask those questions, please, because Mm -hmm. the caregiver needs just as much support. When we're shifting from an Alzheimer caregiving model to a caregiver model for Ruth Ann, Ruth Ann is not isolated, even though it's dementia set apart. Mm -hmm. Ruth Ann is a whole family. Ruth Ann is a caregiver and grief support for grandchildren and the total package of services What a disservice if we're not educating along the way to make it less frightening. Yeah. I love the idea of bringing hospice in for those last six-ish months, if possible, so that you bring that extra care, that extra support alongside, and then family in those last days has the opportunity to sit back and be the family because the arrangements have been made and we are, we're prepared. So I really thank you so much, Christina, for coming on with us today. Um, I look forward to probably having you back to discuss some other hospice scenarios because this has been very, very informative. Thank you. Thank you, friend. It has been my honor.